Good evening and welcome to Columbia at Home. My name is Ken Catandella. I'm Senior Executive Director of the Columbia Alumni Association and University Relations. This evening we have a real treat. Uh, I'm going to be joined by three friends and fellow Colombians to talk food and wine pairings for the holidays with you. First of all, I want to thank each of you for welcoming us into your homes and hopefully into your wine glasses. So without further ado, let me bring on my three panelists for this evening. So Brett Bessire is a graduate of Columbia College and is co-founder and winemaker at Bogline Vineyards in Sonoma and is a co-founder of the Columbia Alumni Association Wine Industry Network. Sarah Goler is an alumna of the engineering school and she, along with her husband, Will Emery, are the owners of Tanat uh, Market and Tavern on the upper, upper west side. And finally, Maria Rivero Gonzalez attended SIPA and along with her brother, Pedro, who is a graduate of the college and the engineering school. Uh, they are the owners of RGNY on the North Fork of Long Island and Rivero Gonzalez wineries in Pana, Mexico. And um, Brent and Maria are um, two of the more than 70 winemakers and vineyard owners across the world, uh, and including uh, people in the wine industry and ancillary businesses. There are several hundred Colombians in our network, including uh, Sarah. Near the end of the program, um, we will have our Q and A with the audience. So put questions into Q and A. And uh, Brent and Maria and many of our other winemaker, alumni winemakers wines uh, are in the CAA uh, virtual wine cellar. And Brent and Maria and many others offer discounts for uh, the Columbia community. And finally, you can follow us on Instagram at CU Winemakers. So without further ado, let's get started. So first question to each of you is you were cast for this evening because of your day job. So I'm gonna ask each of you to tell us a little bit about what it is you do and what's your favorite part of it. So Brent, let's start with you out in Santa Rosa. Thanks, Ken. Uh, so yeah, so we started uh, Fogline back in, um, uh, 2007 started planting our vineyard and we my partner and I do just about everything there is to do so uh, anywhere from the vineyard to um, you know the winemaking itself but I would say probably my favorite part of uh, what we do is is actually usually what happens around this time of year when uh, we are actually harvesting and I spend a fair amount of time out in the vineyards actually sampling the fruit and walking the vineyards and seeing what they're uh, how the fruit's progressing and, and seeing what's happening out there and, and making those uh, decisions on when to pick our fruit, which actually plays a vital role in the ultimate end product. Um, so it's probably my, my favorite time of year and favorite thing to do. And as we go into harvest, harvest is also uh, great, a great time of year, but kind of leading up to it, the anticipation and uh, getting ready to go for that is always, always fun. Great. Uh, Sarah. Hi, so um, I opened Tanat back about almost three years ago with my husband, Will, and it is a farm to table, it was a farm to table restaurant in Manhattan. And during the pandemic, we shut it down and turned it into uh, a grocery using all of our local uh, farms. And it essentially is a private, a grocery store where you can make an appointment to shop and you can buy all of our local produce and also um, a we have a focus on natural lines, which is really one of the things I'm really interested in. So I'm also the beverage director and I select a lot of natural wines and I've had uh, Maria Rivero actually has come to Tanat and showcased her wines um, at a dinner. And so one of my favorite things about what we do is 
learn, I, I love to learn about wines and I love to teach other people and help them find things that they themselves would love. Um, and actually during the, the pandemic, getting to know people and having them come in and try things and then, you know, buy bottles to go and then come back the next week and say, oh, I really love this or this wasn't quite my thing and sort of helping them find what they enjoy the most and figuring out how to get them there was it's been really fun. Great. And Maria, I'll go to you. Hi, Ken. Thank you. So I manage the family wine businesses, both in Mexico and now in uh, the North Fork. We, we bought the place two years ago, so it's been quite the adventure coming into the North Fork, uh, especially launching the brand a year ago with the pandemic. We do certified sustainable low impact wines. So that means the less we add to them, the better we try and, and be uh, very um, real with what we do. And um, we're also a lot into innovation with the brand. So we love, I love, the part that I love the most is experimenting with the, the using different grapes or, the, or using different uh, winemaking techniques with some of the grapes. We also take this innovation through the experience in the tasting room and we do things like the blending sessions where people actually learn how to blend. And uh, all of this learning thing that Sarah's saying, I think people, the more they learn about wine, the more they enjoy it. So we try to look for different approaches and make, make wine approachable for everyone so they can enjoy it a little more. Uh, and just being out there, as, as Brent was saying, the harvest season, just being out there is really, refreshing and it beats staying in an office any day of the year, right? <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and we, you know, build this as a opportunity to talk food and wine uh, for the holidays. So uh, first question to each of you is, you know, now that we're, we're a week away from the beginning of the holiday season, what are your go-to reds and whites. So Sarah, I'm going to let you kick this one off. Um, well, I love the classics. I love Pinot Noir. I love Chardonnay, um, especially for something like Thanksgiving. I think they're really just fabulous. But I also like a lot of the weird grapes um, from lesser known regions and skin contact wines, also known as orange wines. Um, I kind of love all the individuality that each grape can have and how each winemaker turns it into something that's their own. Great. Okay, Maria. Um, more than a red or a white, I'm going to say blank de noirs. I'm, I really think uh, using red grapes to the whites is, uh, it, it's very interesting because then you have as a result a wine that has a very nice acidity and freshness from it be being a white, but also they have uh, more of a body to it and they can really withstand anything. So being the holidays, everyone wants to drink, right? So you want something that won't get boring and that you can keep drinking, but it's flexible enough to eat and enjoy. So Blanc de Noirs are my go-to during the season. Okay, great. Go ahead. Yeah, so we um, always have some Pinot Noir and Chardonnay with our, our dinner. Um, I tend to pop open a bottle of our Zinfandel before dinner as I'm cooking. Uh, I find it's, well, it's kind of going backwards in a way to go to Pinot, which is a little bit more elegant. Uh, it's kind of a nice, if you're just hanging out, drinking a little bit of wine as, as you're getting ready for things and, and uh, you know, uh, cooking or whatever, that it's a nice, nice wine to, to have around to uh, kind of get the party started. So to speak. Okay. Um, for me, it's um, the one time that I think about, you know, warm and comfort. So um, I'll start breaking out uh, Cabernet Francs uh, as a red and uh, Chenin Blancs uh, for whites um, because it, they really tend to uh, go nicely with things that I'm uh, preparing this time of the year, but also uh, they've got some weight and depth to them that I like in the winter time. Um, and then uh, how about celebratory and sweet wines? So um, Maria, I'll let you kick this one off. 
Um, I love I love traditional white sparkling champagne method, but I would I, I try and not go for champagne only because I want to try something different. And I think nationally in the US, there's there's a lot of great sparkling whites being done right now. Uh, and I also love the more um, pet nuts that are being done a lot right now because they're so light and easy to drink. Uh, and you can also find them in a lot of like versions from the natural one to the more traditional ones. Mm -hmm. And um, a little bubbly is always good for celebration, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, Brett. Yeah, I, I kind of would echo what Maria was saying that the, we're actually seeing a lot more sparkling being produced here in Sonoma County. Um, we're kind of in a prime area for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And um, <clears throat> there are some custom crush facilities that are doing uh, sparkling. Uh, so smaller producers can now start, you know, taking their fruit in and, and making uh, some really nice sparkling wines from, from some pretty tremendous fruit. Generally, these are, you know, grapes are picked earlier in the harvest season. Um, so lower sugar to get the, the sparkling wines that they produce. And, um, you know, we, we, the family wine is still the Schramsberg Blanc de Blanc. Um, we drink a lot of that. Uh, usually it's kind of the, the pre-dinner uh, or beginning of dinner kind of thing. Uh, we'll break some of that out and then... Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about like a dessert wine for a finisher, but you know, I actually like sparkling to finish to kind of give you that break, <clears throat> break up, um, you know, maybe the heavier foods of the end of the evening and kind of cleanse the palate and get you ready for, for your dessert. Um, so it's a good time to, to kind of pull out a sparkler then as well. Okay, good. Sarah. Well, I agree with both Maria and Brent. I love sparkling pet now. Champagne, champenoise, all, all the sparkling. Um, in terms of champagne, I think Joyard is beautiful. Um, but if you're also looking for sparkling that's less expensive, the Loire Valley is creating some very beautiful sparkling in a much more economic price range and super beautiful. Um, also, if you're going for a dessert wine, not necessarily for dessert, but um, Sassenach is a really wonderful alternative to a Sauterne, which is more traditional from the south of France. Um, but I agree with Brent, you could uh, have bubbles before, after, during, always good. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I will concur. Uh, I, I do a lot of non-vintage champagnes from, you know, smaller champagne houses, some, some or um, uh, natural wines from um, growers, but also sparkling wines from Austria uh, and the Loire. And uh, dessert wines, I, I really like uh, wines from Entre Lunaire, uh, turns those types, but also uh, late harvest wines, Riesling, Gewürztraminer, um, um, and um, Brunner Veltliner. So those are some really interesting um, sweets. Now let's dig into um, Turkey Day itself. So um, what would you recommend pairing the turkey with? And Brent, we're going to start with you again. Yeah, so we have an interesting dichotomy that happens in our family. Um, my wife drinks no red wine <laughs> and pr really prefers Chardonnay. And our Chardonnay is actually terrific with, uh, with food and turkey. It's, um, it's just got a nice, bright acidity, really beautiful fruit. Um, our region of uh, Sonoma County is the Petaluma Gap and um, you tend to get some kind of tropical notes uh, from, from our vineyard as well as uh, the neighboring vineyard, Daps Crown. Both of those seem to show a lot of what uh, the Petaluma Gap region is about and, and the cooler weather keeps it, uh, keeps those, those wines really, really in balance. Um, and then, you know, Pinot Noir. Um, we'll be having our, 
probably our Russian River Pinot Noir is, is what we're going to go with this year. Um, we have a 16 that right now is really drinking great. Um, tends to be a little bit fuller bodied than what we're getting from, um, from our vineyard, which is a little bit earth, a little more earthy and um, a little bit uh, brighter acidity, uh, just because it is cooler than the Russian River Valley. Um, so it's a little more of a full, little fuller body uh, Russian River Pinot Noir than um, than what uh, our our Sonoma Coast Pinots would be. Great, Sarah. Um, I also think you can go with either a red or a white. Um, if I were to go for a white, I'd go for something hardy, so a Chardonnay, or you could go for something like a Jura Chardonnay, which has some deep. Uh, nutty notes due to the process in which it is made where it forms a layer of floor between the top of the barrel and the air to protect the wine. And this is similar to what happens in sherry, but um, these wines are very dry, but just have so much depth and structure to them. And I think that they lend themselves very well to Turkey. But you could also go with something like a red, like a um, Pinot Noir, or another option would be Poussard, which is another French grape that has, um, it's a light red with nice sort of softer tannins and a lot of fruit. So I think it would complement well turkey. Maria. So um, I'm Mexican, so I haven't been doing Thanksgiving forever. But the very first time we did Thanksgiving, it was like five years ago, and it was just my parents and myself, and we decided we wanted to try and cook a Thanksgiving dinner. And I ended up doing a Cab Franc blind tasting, which was very fun. So I, I stuck to only three wines, because if you do a blind tasting and you do a lot of them, and it, there's a lot of people, it gets a little iffy and complicated. Well, we did three Cab Francs and we put in, I mixed in ours from Mexico. And uh, I really like the Cab Franc because it's, it's very, the turkey has a soft like texture to it. And the Cab Franc is very elegant, but it's also soft and uh, complex enough in the nose that it, it pairs very, very well. And uh, it's, it was just a fun activity to do it with three because then we got to see the differences between uh, regions. As Brent was saying, a Pinot Noir is not the same one region to the other, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think we need to stop being afraid to pair things with white, red, rosé. I think if wines are well balanced and have a good acidity to it, they can really be flexible with food. So if you look for a good acidity in a wine, you, you can't go wrong. And then it just depends about the flavor, how you're cooking the turkey and all of that, right? Great. Um, you know, Brent knows this. Um, I come down on the Zinfandel side for, um, for turkey. Um, and then if this, the second bottle will usually be from uh, the Southern Rhone, so probably a Chateau Neuf de Pop. Um, so Syrah, Grenache, Mouverdra. And uh, again, Sarah, the uh, hearty whites, uh, you know, full bodied. So um, we tend to do things like Grenache Blanc or uh, Rebola. And I, you know, Rebola, it's an interesting consistency uh, that I find pairs really, really well, surprisingly well with turkey. Um, so let's move on to sides now. And so Sarah, you're up first. Give us the side and then give us the pairing. Okay, so I guess it's getting kind of obvious that I like all the strange grapes out there. Um, so I guess it's no surprise that I've done the same with the pairing that I've made, which is I like garlic mashed potatoes, um, which I actually sent out in your uh, recipe list. Uh, and I would pair it with a Slovenian grape, a white grape called Zelen, which has just it's it uh, actually if it's aged um, and it has some skin contact, it actually can have some of these like sweet potato notes. So you can imagine that even as a fresh wine, it would pair very well with mashed potatoes. Great, Maria. Well, I mean, 
Uh, I really like the green bean casserole. It's one of the things that I liked when we first started doing Thanksgiving. And um, although I think it pairs great with the Cap Franc or Bordeaux blend or even Chateau of the Pat that usually my family likes to, to drink during like the main course, I, I really like to open a, a, on the side a, a glass of Sauvignon Blanc only because it has that higher note and it, it kind of brings me a little back. I love the reds and I think, as you said, Ken, it's, it, it's the first time of year when you want to feel something a little cozier and like a hog with this uh, cozier, bigger reds. But I also kind of need a break here and there. So it's, uh, we, all, we always have a Sauvignon Blanc there on tow for people that don't drink a lot of red as well. And I think it goes great with the sides. Great, Brett. Yeah, I can't add much to this. I, I have to say, I, I love the garlic mashed potatoes myself. We also, um, my wife makes these rolls that uh, the kids pretty much only eat the rolls and they're like a, a, a uh, almost like a cinnamon roll type of thing, but like with a, I don't know, lighter type of dough. Um, I'm not sure that wine goes with them other than maybe a sparkling wine would be good with that. Um, and it's funny now, Ken, you got me thinking about Syrah and I love Syrah. Most of the winemakers I know love Syrah. Um, but it's, uh, it's one of those things that, that definitely picks up the character of where it comes from more uh, as much as any, any grape, I think. And especially the coastal Syrahs that we get in this area. Um, are really, really nice. And they kind of have that acidity still to them and the brightness that you don't get from <clears throat> a lot of other places where they're, where it's much warmer. Um, but it still has that volume and that body and that, you know, kind of iron bloodiness that, uh, that kind of is typical of Syrah, but still with an, enough acidity to kind of cut through the butter and, and uh, the grease of, of, the, di of the meal. <laughs> And um, my side is roasted uh, yams with pancetta and so a little black truffle. Um, and so um, I'm not a stuffing mashed potato person, so I, you know, I, I experiment with some other kinds of things. Um, but if you're doing roasted yams or something like that, I find that uh, white Rioja or uh, pecorino, which is a grape uh, that's pretty much indigenous to Abruzzo uh, and Le Marche in Italy. Uh, and both are you know, reasonably priced and uh, they, they really pair very well with the, with the fattiness of uh, the pancetta um, and the truffle. Um, and so then that will move us, if you, if you still have room for dessert, and so I think, Maria, you're up first on dessert. So first I want to say after, after you decide, now I want to have Thanksgiving at your house. I agree. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, so I don't, I don't know what the usual desserts are. I get very confused because there's always so many and, and everyone does like different things also depending where you are, I guess. But I always find that there's chocolate on top. Like there's always something chocolate, right? Either if it, even if it's just like pieces of chocolate that you'll have after, because what I do know it's Thanksgiving people like to eat and it, it's like never ending feast, which is very nice. So I, I kind of like to end on, on that hog note and, and go back to those um, Bordeaux blends. We, the, the very first wine that we did in Mexico was our Bordeaux blend. And now we do one here in the North Fork as well. And uh, I like, just taking out all vintages and end the note with like an old vintage um, Bordeaux blend or maybe a Chateau of the Pat that my mom loves with some chocolate. And then it's like that big hog. If there's a fire, then even better, right? Right. Go ahead. Yeah, so we do uh, pumpkin pie. We're very traditional here. Um, and also date nut pudding and um, Again, I, I would go back to the sparkling if, if we can, if there's any left at this point. Um, <laughs> and if everybody's still awake, um, that's, that's always a good option for, for with a pie to kind of, kind of cleanse the palate and, and get you to the next bite. 
and not too heavy either, which after you consume this giant meal, you know, something a little bit lighter and brighter, I think it's kind of nice and a little lower alcohol too, because right. at that point we usually don't need any more. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Sarah? Um, I also love pumpkin chiffon pie or pumpkin pie, all, all the pumpkin things. Um, and I would definitely pop another bottle of bubbly. But if you didn't go that way, I think that you would do very well with something like an off dry Riesling, which I think would complement well your pumpkin. Great. Uh, and those of you who know me know I don't eat dessert at all. Um, but uh, I grew up making a Sicilian dessert called cassata. Uh, which most Americans know as a cannoli cake, um, which uh, is not quite right. But uh, there are, I have lots of friends uh, who are out there tonight listening, and I know you all do cannoli cakes. Uh, so uh, I would pair that with a Moscato Spumanti, so something sparkling. And uh, if you wanted to go on the sweet side, uh, something like a sweet Marsala, or a, Malvesi, a late harvest Malvasia. So those are, you now have uh, four different Thanksgivings, pick a place, come and see us virtually. Uh, we're, all, we're all going to be socially distancing, but we've got a lot of questions from the audience. And so uh, get right to it. So first up, th this one's for all of you and um, I'm going to start with Sarah on because um, she is our guruess of the uh, interesting regions. Um, what are some of the lesser known uh, wine regions, um, particularly in Europe, that uh, you know you uh, you gravitate towards? Um, I love Croatian wines like Plava Kamali or Slovenia. Um, turns out some stupendous wines like Rafos, which is a red grape from grass. Or if you're looking for something like more funky and very, uh, very old winemaking styles, you can go back to Georgia and think about some of their skin contact or amber or orange wines. They all mean the same thing. Um, and you can look for things like Kisi or Mitzvane or Ricazzatelli and those wines have so much texture and history and um, you can taste a lot of them are done in a traditional method uh, where they ferment them in these very large clay pots called quevri which are buried underground and you can taste the dustiness on the tannins uh, from the, the clay pots and it's it's just really amazing. Good, Maria. Um, How about Parra? Well, I mean, I have to say Mexico because a lot of people don't know this, but Parras is the oldest wine growing region in the whole continent. So wine, wine started there in 1497. Uh, the Jesuits came and they found uh, Parras. So Parras means vine in Spanish. And uh, really, I think we've, the last 30 years, Mexico has excelled in doing um, red blends, a lot of Syrah, especially in Parras. You were mentioning Syrah and it really, it, it gives a very bold expression of the Syrah. Um, and uh, everyone thinks tequila or mezcal when they think Mexico, right? But we are, we are doing great fine wines. And um, I love, Uruguay as well, Tanat is a grape that not a lot of people uh, maybe know, but it's, uh, it's also very rich and very uh, round. And um, I, I drink a lot of that as well, so. Brent? Yeah, um, it's interesting because I, I think that it probably like a lot of people, um, you know, my wine, uh, knowledge is growing as I travel more. And I've actually been spending a fair amount of time in Germany and actually have been in South Africa. Um, 
a couple times over the last couple of years. And to try and explore those regions a little bit more has been interesting. You know, South Africa is doing some really nice things with Pinot Noir and, and Chardonnay. Um, so it's interesting to see the comparison to what we're doing here. The other thing I'm looking a lot at actually is, um, you know, as we're seeing more impact from, you know, fires and, and climate change is to kind of explore areas that are even a little bit cooler than uh, where we are. So we're seeing, uh, you know, Anderson Valley is becoming kind of more important in terms of Pinot Noir for uh, California. And then uh, as you go further north into Humboldt County, um, which is known for some other products, but uh, they, um, there's starting to be some vineyards planted up there that, you know, definitely have that coastal impact um, and have been escaping some of the, the impact from smoke and so forth that we've seen over the last three years. So um, there, we're kind of exploring those areas a little bit. We're kind of seeing what some other people are doing from up there. Um, it seems like most of the winemakers that are up there are not maybe getting the results that um, <clears throat> we'd like to maybe see, but it's kind of one of those things also that you have to see how the wine uh, matures. And um, so those are areas I'm really interested in right now, uh, especially as we look at um, expanding outside of our immediate area for, for grape sources. Great. Um... I would say a couple of regions that I'm really keen on that for the, a great value for your money uh, are some of the small AOCs in Languedoc, uh, Corbiere, Minabois, uh, E2, and then uh, Central Italy. Uh, Umbria is uh, among my favorite, uh, and Le Marche is a real up and coming uh, wine region. Um, so now some other questions. So. Uh, Sarah, um, and I'm going to ask you guys to uh, go quick only because we, we got so many questions. Um, some pairings, uh, wine pairings for uh, vegetarian Thanksgiving or, or uh, plant based product, uh, plant based fruits. Yeah, if you're going for some sort of like lighter, uh, sorry, uh, if you're going for something sort of lighter and plant based, I think it would do well to have sort of like some larger uh, full-bodied wines that would pair, that would pull out nice features of your, for example, if you had a potato dish, which we spent a significant amount of time on already, or if you wanted to have something like sauteed greens, then I think that you should pair it with something um, floral and with nice acid and hopefully some sort of acidity and um, salt. And I think you would do well with a wine like Falangina from Italy. Um, yeah, I would say go for something sort of light and bright for something that is based on grains or uh, greens. Great. Uh, Maria, we have a question. Uh, and since you make a Riesling, uh, what are some great pairings for dry Rieslings, food pairings? Um, I think Riesling is actually very versatile because it's dry, but it also has a nice sweetness, especially in the nose, the aromas. Uh, I like to pair Riesling actually with desserts, something tarty, like an apricot or mango tart. It, it becomes the tarty, it, it, it becomes a very um, complementary pairing where tart meets tart. So it, it's, it's very explosive and very strong. Great. Um, Brent, we have a question about uh, old vine Zin versus Zinfandel. Is there a difference? Um, this individual says that they like old vine Zin, but not necessarily Zin itself. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Um, has a lot of angles to it. The uh, I would say that you might want to think about why you're liking the old vines in it seems like a lot of old vines in tend to have some residual sugar and tend to be a little bit you know darker um a little jammier than maybe uh so for example our dry creeks in is is actually a very um it's on the lighter side of zinfandel a lot of people compare it to some wines that were being made in napa and 
you know, kind of the 80s and 90s, you know, where it's not super jammy and not over the top extracted. And if you're liking that extraction, you know, my question would also be kind of back to that person is, do you like port? You know, if you like port, you probably are liking the sweetness. And, and one of the things that we don't have in this country that is kind of crazy is, is, you know, we don't say whether wine's sweet, whether there's, you know, unless you really go into the tech notes, you're not going to find out if there's residual sugar in that wine. And so what I would recommend to somebody like that is, you know, go to your local wine shop and tell them what you like and why you like it, if you can figure that out. And, um, you know, they can point you in the right direction. I mean, we have, we have had periodically wines, we had an old wine in that, you know, it was significant amount of residual sugar and uh we always said well the good thing about the residual sugar is that it hides the uh the alcohol which was like 17 percent of the time so definitely much bigger wine <laughs> yeah until the next morning when you realize it didn't hide it all that well um, yeah <laughs> um so oh here's a question for me because i think i mentioned uh cab franc what are your favorite cab francs so um I love Cab Franc uh, from the Loire, um, from uh, Tus the Tuscan region of Italy are making some incredible Cab Francs right now. Um, and there's a really good one that I have fallen in love with on the North Fork uh, <laughs> from RGNY. Uh, so if you want one, I, I, I probably I think the finest example of a Cab Franc I've seen uh, uh, from the North Fork. And then the next question is, um, and Sarah, you can take this one again. Let's keep it going quick. Uh, what's orange wine? Orange wine is a skin. So basically you take white wine grapes and you ferment them on the skin. So you pull out a lot of the tannic structure as well as uh, often color. And that is the reason that you get different hues like orange or amber or salmon or other such colors that you don't expect, but you also get a deep richness to the wine that you don't find in, um, it, it brings out a whole other flavor profiles that you don't find in just general white wines. Um, so they're kind of the white wines of the red wine world. That's a good way of putting it. Maria, uh, some affordable wines from Mexico. Uh, Cielo. <laughs> uh, Monte Chanik, you can find Monte Chanik here in New York as well. They do a great uh, Sauvignon, a great Chenin Blanc that I love, and a great Merlot as well. Um, I think th those are the ones that you're going to find in the States for now. We're doing a big push and effort to bring more. Uh, fortunately, all of the Mexican wine right now is being drunk in Mexico. Uh, but I, I think it needs to go out and conquer the world a little more. Okay, good. Um, Brent, what wines do you pair well with uh, gamey meats like uh, medicine? Yeah, I would say Zinfandel goes really nicely with that. Um, also the Syrahs that I was talking about, we do, um, we do an old vine Syrah that comes from the Gris Vineyard up on top of Bradford Mountain. We only make a couple barrels of the year. There's, uh, they're supposed to be the oldest Syrah vines possibly even in the entire country. And uh, makes this fantastic wine that I honestly don't care if we sell. I'll just, it's, you know, two barrels, I can drink that. Um, <laughs> but I think it, 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 there's enough, you know, acidity to that that in, in, in the wine is interesting enough that it can compete with, with those kinds of uh, pairings. Great. Uh, question, uh, can you give us a few super Tuscans? So I'll take that one. At the highest end, um, my favorite is Sassicaia. Um, and then if you, if you started to go into the middle a little bit, there is a wonderful, wonderful uh, a vineyard called Podere Forte, and make some extremely exceptional um, Cab Franc Sangiovese um, Super Tuscans that are outstanding. Um, and um, Altovino, 
is also a great uh, buy. Uh, it's a uh, Dumani is the uh, winemaker. Uh, they're very pricey, except as Altrovino is a um, middle class budget, uh, really fine example of um, Super Tuscan. And then for under $12, uh, Monte Antico, which you can find pretty much anywhere. Uh, it is Sangiovese Merlot and occasionally a little Cab Franc. Our next question, um, Sarah, can you recommend some orange wines? Sure, <laughs> come on up to tonight. I have a lot. Um, there's a lot of really cool orange wine coming out of Oregon. Um, if you look at uh, Fossil and Fawn, uh, they make some cool wines. Uh, Malouf. Um, they have a uh, Gewurztraminer, which spends something like 20 days on skins, and the aromatics are gorgeous, but it's quite dry and and uh, a little bit tannic and spicy. Uh, if you want to go to Georgia, the, the country, um, Kakedi has some beautiful wines. Um, yeah. Good, good. Um, and then uh, Maria, uh, what do you think of blind tastings? Uh, I love them. Uh, when we, before we uh, bought Marta Clara, now our GNY, I, uh, I took, we went on a weekend uh, with some of my friends to the Hamptons and I brought in uh, maybe 25 roses and, the, and we did a blind tasting. And then the next day we did it with Sauvignon Blanc as well. And I think just, it, it, takes, it takes a lot of the messiness away from judging a specific wine. A lot of times the wine that you think is great ends up being at the bottom and then some wine that you've never heard of or that you always say, ah, eh, ends up being on the top. So it, it just takes a lot of the prejudgments away and uh, it's a great way to learn and to actually talk about the wines without, without any prejudice, I guess. Okay, good. And Brent, um, what can you tell us about Gewurztraminer? Because <laughs> I know well, that you make one. We did make one, yes. Uh, I like Gewurz a lot, but it's um, getting harder and harder to find. Actually, our source was uh, here next to our winery and got ripped out by the uh, owner of the vineyard. Um, we also just became aware of one of the other vineyards we work with that uh, just ripped theirs out too. So it's a challenge because um, for, hopefully this isn't what we're seeing happening to Sonoma County, but um, you know what's happening in Napa is that you know, you, you're seeing single varieties of grapes over there growing where it's all Cabernet. Um, and I worry that we're starting to see a little bit here in Sonoma County where everything, you know, because Pinot is kind of becoming the king and demands the most price. Uh, from a vineyard owner's perspective, uh, a lot of people are just not willing to grow something that isn't going to, uh, you know, yield them the greatest uh, return on their investment. So, um, but yeah, nice dry gewurz I like a lot. I think it's a really interesting grape and um, it's kind of fun to see what it, what it turns out to be. We barrel fermented ours and uh, I think it turned out pretty nicely. Yeah, and I think uh, Alsatian gewurz cleaners still are sort of the uh, standard and what's nice is you can get them at reasonable price points. Uh, you don't have to pay ground crew money for it. Uh, mm -hmm. Next question. Sarah, um, what would you recommend wine-wise for cheesy Netflix holiday movies and pecan pie? <laughs> ah. Well, if you wanted to get into what I think would pair really well with the pecan pie, it probably wouldn't pair very well with the cheesy movie part. But if you wanted really a good pairing for pecan pie, I would say maybe a dry sherry because the hazelnut notes would just be, oh, and I see a fog line. Um, I can't read it from here, uh, but uh, I, 
I think a, a Sherry or a Vin Jean would be gorgeous, or a Zinfandel from Fog Line, or any of Maria's wines. <laughs> um, but I also think if you if you just want to have a good time, uh, like a Provence rosé would be, yeah. um, or just a nice high acid rosé would very well go with right. you can find. Okay, Maria, what do you think is the, and I'm going to ask each of you really quickly to answer this, uh, major difference between um, winemaking in the U.S. and uh, the old world? Oof. Um, well, I guess not having a lot of rules in terms of what the label has to say makes it maybe more complicated for the customer to understand, but it also gives us uh, more freedom to play around with. Um, I like the old world personally. So we, we do a lot of those things. As, as Sarah was saying, we're, we're doing um, clay this year, both in Mexico and here, doing orange wines. So Sarah, when they're ready, I'll let you know. Um, but I, I just think winemaking is, and you and I have talked about it, can it becomes this huge matrix when you can add so many things to it and that's why it keeps us entertained, right, Brad? Yeah, um, I think it's interesting though that you, you know, people delineate it because I think that there's, there's influences both directions and I think that you've seen, especially in Italy, you know, we hear about a lot of Italian winemakers coming over to UC Davis and learning how to make wine the UC Davis way. And I think it's, it's I, in my opinion, it's improved their wine significantly over there. Um, the, you know, I've worked with winemakers from all over the world in, in uh, the custom crush facilities I've worked in it. You know, they're, they always, the guys from, you know, France or, or uh, uh, Italy will always have things that they're like, oh, you can do this here, or you can't do that here, you know, and it's, it's, it's interesting to hear the differences, but um, I think that there's, there's starting to be more and more overlap. And um, so I don't think that there's necessarily clear delineation between the two uh, for certain countries. Yeah, I mean, we have uh, one of our uh, Columbia winemakers, Mark Tarlov, is making uh, as Burgundian a Burgundy as you can find uh, in the Willamette Valley. Uh, he did a blind tasting of some of his against Grand Cru Burgundies with Burgundy collectors. It was pretty remarkable. So I, I, I tend to agree with you. So I'm going to pivot. Sorry. Um, um, here we go. Pairings with Christmas cookies. Are you switching? Am I supposed to answer yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, come Pairs on. Christmas cookies. What is your turf, Sarah? Hmm. Well, would probably go with something funky if my cookie was bland. Um, or something kind of bright and light. Um, I'm not sure. It would probably depend on what I wanted to drink and I would think of the cookie as an afterthought. <laughs> uh, you know, an off dry rosé, you can never go wrong with cookies. Um, this is from someone who doesn't eat cookies, but um, that, would be, uh, that would be something. Um, what is your, and this is for all of you, and I'll let you start this one, Sarah, because you actually are pretty much an expert at this. What is, you, what is your sort of go-to at $20 or less? Um, so we have a lot of really great wines in that range. And uh, I mean, our house wine for a very long time when we were a restaurant was um, from Spain. It was called uh, Gulf Ablo, and we had a Granacha and a Verdejo. And they're, it's actually a great story, but there's three brothers and they grew these vines organically and biodynamically. And then they called in Juan Antonio Ponce, who's a well-known winemaker from Babal that makes the Babal wines. And I uh, asked him to like, hey, could you like help us out and to make wine? And um, it's sort of his side project and they're just like super easy drinking and they come in a liter bottle. So they're just some of our, we've, we've emptied out the warehouses <laughs> in the <Okay>. US. <laughs> uh, Maria? 
uh, you know, in Mexico, we, we also drank a lot of wine from Spain, like uh, classics that, that, nev that could never go wrong, like Emilio Moro and Muga. And uh, they, they always, uh, what I like about them is they, they, they're very consistent in their quality year over year. So you get that nice price, but you're also consistently drinking something that's good and, and great and effortlessly good, I guess. Brent? I don't have an answer for this one. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, and I'll, I'll throw in um, Vigna Real, uh, Rioja, uh, again, one of our winemakers, Victor Galicia. Uh, from Cune in Spain, consistent year in, year out, um, not very expensive. We are about to run out of time, but a couple of things that we want to do first. Uh, first of all, um, we will uh, this evening um, randomly select someone from uh, participants today to receive some alumni wine. So you may be getting a special email from me. Um, we have two things that we, two gifts that we will send you uh, tomorrow. Uh, one will be the Columbia uh, Alumni Association Wine Industry um, Thanksgiving wine picks. Um, many of them are available at your local wine shops. Uh, others you can purchase direct uh, from the wineries. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking particularly at Brent and Maria here. Um, and, um, Oh, we're hearing, okay. Um, they would like the list of recommendations tonight. Well, um, if uh, you can figure out how to do that, Jenna, uh, that would be fabulous. Otherwise, I promise you it'll come first thing in the morning. And the second thing is Sarah um, has put together uh, really spectacular recipes for Thanksgiving. Um, and we will be sending those to you as well. Um, as is our tradition, we end each of these by toasting uh, all of you for spending this time with us. So, um, Sarah, what will you be toasting everybody with? Well, I hope everyone is happy and healthy and safe. And I'm toasting you all with a, a 2015 Jura Chardonnay um, that has these nutty notes that I think would go really well with uh, turkey. And I hope you all have a wonderful holiday. Okay, great. Maria. Um, I'm toasting with our white Merlot, so Blanc de Noirs. As I started, I'm, I'm into the white, the Blanc de Noirs because they, they're very different and they have the best of both red and white. And you can go to our website, rgnywine.com. We have it at 15% off. So if you don't want to break your heads and just have one wine for Thanksgiving, I think this is a good idea. It's a good, uh, complete round wine. And uh, same as Arrow, just wishing everyone uh, to stay healthy and enjoy time with family right now. Brent. Uh, yeah, so I have, as I earlier i'm not very good at this part uh our 2016 zinfandel from dry creek valley from the gris vineyard this is a wine that we've made uh since our very first vintage in 2009 and is uh about 1200 feet in elevation on the top of bradford mountain uh, aged on french and american oak so it has a nice smoothness in the mid palate that you get from the french oak as well as having that uh, punched up fruit in the front and the nice spice on the finish. So really, really balanced for Zinfandel, great food wine, but also great for just sitting around sipping and uh, enjoying on a cool winter evening, which I understand a lot of people are, uh, it's getting a little chilly and it's supposed to get chilly here at night now, starting this week. So uh, cheers to everyone and thank you all for being here and please be safe and uh, take care of one another. And I don't play favorites, so I never drink. So first of all, I've gotten a couple of questions. What are all those bottles behind you? Uh, those are all wines made by Colombians. And um, there are a, a number of RGNY and Cielos up there. Uh, there's a whole bunch of fog lines, uh, among others. 
but I could not select one over the other and it would be unseemly to have a glass in each hand. So I'm going with a Rioja Reserva uh, from Cune, uh, Victor Yaritia Yarba, who is a 2001 graduate of the business school and is the fifth generation um, head of um, Cune in Rioja. Uh, and I join everybody in wishing you all a very, very safe and healthy and happy holiday. And we are actually going to take next Thursday, or next Wednesday off from um, Columbia at home, but we'll be back the following week. Some of you put in chat, uh, you want the recommendations we spoke about. And so we will put all of that together um, as well. Um, and you should feel free to uh, email us if you've got any questions and we'll be happy to respond to you. So good health, much happiness and happy Thanksgiving. And thank you guys for doing this with me. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Ken.